For the past two decades, Somalia has been widely regarded as a failed state. Civil war, famines, humanitarian crises, and a radicalized insurgency left Somalia in ruins. Its people scattered, and its capital, Mogadishu, widely regarded as the most dangerous place on earth. But in 2012, things began to change. A new representative government was established. A draft constitution was approved. And the militant insurgency was forced to retreat from Mogadishu. It was a turning point for what had seemed to be one of the world's most intractable conflicts. For the first time in a generation, peace in Somalia is more than a distant dream or a fond memory. It is an achievable reality. In this film, we explore Somalia's journey during this remarkable year. A journey marked by violence, political infighting, and high-stakes diplomacy. We must move ahead quickly. This is Somalia's journey from transition to transformation. Somalis had gone through a period of civil strife for 20 years. And we were getting into the 21st year. The trauma and experience that had been inflicted could be seen in the streets of Mogadishu. People had been cowed down to submission. You could only see the occasional woman clutching a child in a hurry, crossing from one side of the street to another. And no vehicle. Every building bore the bullet and bomb shells. There was an eerie silence. You knew life could be cut at any time. Following the fall of Somalia's dictatorship in 1991, the country plunged into 21 years of civil war. Warlords and Islamists fought for control, leaving a collapsed state unable to protect or provide for its own people. War, drought and famine destroyed the lives of millions of Somalis. And without any functioning government, an insurgent group, Al-Shabaab, seizes an opportunity to rule capturing large swathes of Somali territory. A transitional federal government is put in place, but it is based outside of the country and is a government in name only. Protected by African Union peacekeepers, the TFG controls only a few city blocks in Mogadishu. With the country on the brink of anarchy, the United Nations refocuses its efforts to promote a viable political process in Somalia. It is not the number of initiatives for Somalia that is in deficit, but concrete and practical actions on the ground. This process is to be led by the United Nations Political Office for Somalia, or UNPOS. The Secretary General appoints a Tanzanian diplomat, Dr. Augustine Mahiga, as his special representative. He asked me to inject energy and move the peace process forward, which appeared to be faltering. But the transitional federal government, now in its 15th incarnation, appears to be stalling because of serious political infighting threatening to split the already fragile administration in two. The rift was so intense that all the signs of having two governments, one led by the speaker and another led by the president, were there. On the 8th of June 2011, 
a conference is organized in Kampala by the United Nations Political Office for Somalia. It is to be attended by Somali government representatives and the international community. It is a last-ditch effort to salvage the TFG and to reconcile the differences between the President, Sheikh Sharif Sheikh Ahmed, and the Speaker, Sharif Hassan Sheikh Adan. They couldn't even talk to each other. They couldn't even face each other. They were staying in different floors, and I had to be running up and down. I'm glad the whole of Africa with the facilitation of Ugandan President Museveni, eventually the two men agree to come together. But this needs to be formalized immediately. I had to sit down and write a draft of the Kampala Court, and they had to get it in 45 minutes. It's agreed that within just 12 months, a newly appointed parliament will ratify a provisional constitution and transparently select a president and speaker. But for a political process to succeed, the security situation needs to be confronted. No one felt in 2011 in Kampala that the country was really ripe yet to move to a transition. The security conditions that, that prevailed were just, were just simply weren't conducive. You can't separate the security from, from the political. You have to create the conditions, the security conditions for the political process to, to actually uh, proceed. At the time of the Kampala Accord, Al-Shabaab controlled most of Mogadishu. The African Union forces, AMISOM, had arrived in 2007 to bring stability to Somalia but had struggled to secure even Mogadishu itself. The environment was very hostile. We worked very hard after that Kampala Accord to push the extremist forces out of Mogadishu. In July 2011, Al-Shabaab launches its annual Ramadan offensive. But this time, Amazon and the Somali forces are ready for them. We started taking building by building. We used to call it creeping operation because we used to drive uh, drill holes within the building and you capture another building and another building after that building because these buildings had tunnels uh, crisscross. It was a fairly lengthy, drawn out, and I would actually argue fairly bloody affair. Head to head, slow clearance of the city. Amisom troops supporting the Somali national forces recapture areas of Mogadishu formerly under Al-Shabaab control. In August 2011, under pressure from Amisom and its allies, Al-Shabaab withdraws from Mogadishu. That marked the beginning of the end of the, 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 the Shabab. But Amisom and Somali forces paid a high price. You visit the hospital, you find 10 of your people injured. You lose one or two or even more. Yeah. But then again, you are motivated by the fact that you must make Somalia safe for Somalis, first of all, but for the rest of the region and the stability of the continent and the world. I'll be here with you. Hard-won security gains in Mogadishu allow space for the political process to move forward. To capitalize on this rare moment of opportunity, UNPOS convenes an unprecedented meeting of all stakeholders at Mogadishu's airport, bringing together all major political players from across Somalia 
as well as international partners. Holding such a high-profile event in Mogadishu would have been unthinkable just a few weeks earlier. I call you to deliver tangible, meaningful resources and results. All our lives was in transition for the last 20 years. Uh, one years, and uh, particularly our government institutions was in transition. Why? Because we never found a framework that will allow us or guide us politically, socially, economically to be able to get out of the transition. For the first time in two decades, representatives of major regional administrations such as Puntland and Galmadug, as well as the moderate religious group Ahlu Sunnah Wal Jamaa, come together with the transitional federal government in a spirit of unity for peace. They deserve to be congratulated. They deserve to be encouraged. They deserve to be assisted by the international community. The meeting, hosted by UNPOS, sends an unambiguous signal to Somalis, the region and the international community that change is coming. We want to send a message that this was a different process, a process with integrity, a process with a transparency. The meeting adopts an ambitious plan called the Roadmap. It sets out benchmarks in the key areas of good governance, reconciliation, constitutional reform and security. And critically, it sets a firm date of August 2012 to complete the transitional tasks. Somali civil society is widely consulted in preparing the document. And with assistance from the international community, the roadmap will be owned by and driven by the Somali people. Key Somali political players known as principals sign a document holding them to account for its delivery. Critically, the regional players support and refine the process over the next 12 months in what is termed the Garraway process. In December 2011, the United Nations Secretary General makes a landmark visit to Mogadishu, confirming the UN's commitment to the roadmap and to Somalia. I'm announcing today that the United Nations Political Office for Somalia, UNPOS, will relocate to Mogadish uh, January uh, next year. And now the clock is ticking. Much needs to be accomplished and there is no time to lose. We must move ahead quickly. It must be done in an inclusive and transparent way. The deadline is August uh, next year. Deadlines are absolutely essential. One year, quite clear. And I think it was enough time to concentrate the mind. It was a year that would sort of like make it or break it. Uh, so if we don't deliver it, we all fail. So, and failure was not an option. The ongoing security threat rules out the possibility of public elections. However, the appointment of a new parliament to represent the Somali people is a key milestone of the roadmap. To ensure that their voices are heard in their government, the Somalis turn to their traditional authorities, the powerful and respected clan elders, to nominate candidates for the new parliament. Before colonialism came to Somalia, the only governance we had was through the elders. The elders had uh, unwritten custom and uh, conventions that they used to solve disputes among clans. And the Somalian people, the only group they could trust were the traditional elders. The trust still they were there. We should have a mechanism whereby we know that the parliamentarian, next parliamentarians, would come from communities and would be accountable to, the, to those communities. It's just paradoxical that this country, which was seen as, as a shattered, fractured nation, should actually have what is a deeply imbued set of traditions, and anthropologically, and politically, and culturally, that would have allowed one to actually lean on something that helped unify the country rather quickly. 
MPs nominated by the elders need to meet stringent criteria defined by a group called the Technical Selection Committee. Peter de Klerk sat on the committee. Technical Selection Committee comprised a, a number of Somali actors, intellectuals, uh, women and men. It also had a number of international observers as well as uh, two non-voting members, including myself. The Technical Selection Committee's main responsibility is ensuring that all candidates are well-educated and fully qualified. And a key provision of the roadmap is the exclusion of the warlords from the political process. We had to check 135 elders who are representing the whole Somalia. Some clans, they submitted their warlords, others they did not. But as a 27 people, we knew by heart who is warlord and who is not warlord. Where the Technical Selection Committee felt changes needed to be made and certain people with a history of, of violence or intimidation had to be replaced, they actually did that. But not everyone in Somalia is pleased with this democratic and transparent approach to political transition. Al-Shabaab begins to strike back. Many of the main stakeholders of the roadmap process are directly targeted by the insurgents. There was a huge explosion. A suicide bomb. People were ducking. Windows were rattling. And I was terrified. My life was uh, in danger, uh, as well as the lives of those who worked with me, my colleagues, ministers, and other staff members, because the kind of work that we were doing, the roadmap, and uh, were seen as a threat to Al-Shabaab. I've seen the uh, SMS messages sometimes coming in, in English, sometimes in Somali, uh, to our colleagues, and they would say things like, today is your last day. And it made us, you know, uh, more vigorous. To, we, we became like we're not going to be scared from those people who had threatened the people many years. If they want to kill us, let them kill us. It is, our time is up. But it is this time that we need to be on the side of the Somali people. Another critical task of the roadmap process is the ratification of a provisional constitution. Supported by the UN and spearheaded by Minister of Constitutional Affairs, Abdi Hosh Jibril, a Somali lawyer recently returned from Canada. Most of the tenets or articles in the constitution, uh, as much as they are about dry legal language, but they also involve a social contract between citizens and the state, basic fundamental rights about uh, land and resource issues. Before the constitution is adopted, it needs to be ratified by a wide range of stakeholders called the National Constituent Assembly. 825 representatives of all strata of Somali civil society convene in Mogadishu to read and then vote on whether or not to adopt the provisional constitution. But getting agreement on some of the more contentious issues contained within the constitution will not be easy. The issue of women's participation in government will also prove controversial. The Somali women, for the last 20 years, their political capital has declined. Young ladies were not sent to school. Jobs have been lost. They, you know, completely male-dominated. One of the elders came to me and I said, look, Prime Minister, are you forcing me to select a woman uh, to represent me in the parliament? And I said, yes, because you are a traditional leader only, not only for the male uh, of your clan, but also the females in your clan. Eventually, after eight days' intense deliberation, the Prime Minister announces the conclusion. <laughs> Somalia. 
With Somalia's provisional constitution adopted, candidates are put forward by clan elders for the 275 positions in the new smaller Somali legislature. But the looming 20 August deadline to establish a new parliament and the pressures of selecting 30% female representation are felt by all involved in the process. One of the agreements was to give women 30% quota. The, the elders were very well aware that we had a deadline to meet, so that by not budging in the end, uh, they were likely to get things their way if they were not inclined to let women into either the Constituent Assembly or Parliament. It's finally agreed that the quota of female representation be reduced to 15%. To the international community and UMPOS, the most important thing for them was to end this transitional and to succeed this process and to form a government which is not transitional. So at the end of the day, uh, the 30% was a line we could not hold, even with the strong intervention of our, uh, our, our, our colleagues, our female colleagues. 15% to me is, 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 is much acceptable than what it used to be. The one before that, I think it was like 2 or 3%. So it's a... And now, now my advice to the Somali women is now you have four years to build your political capital. The selected 275 parliamentarians are a mix of former government officials, professionals, civil servants, the business community, women's groups and social activists. They are also the most qualified legislature in Somalia's history. The deadline of 20th August is finally here for the new parliament to be sworn in. But nothing is going as planned. Breakdowns in, in computers, breakdowns in <laughs> photocopying machines, uh, uh, power failures, artificial power failures. Meanwhile, time was going. We must swear, we must have the ceremony on 20th August. If we couldn't have that day, this process would have been stopped, yeah, collapse. We decided to get the swearing in done at the airport. As dusk falls, UN staff scrambled to set up a usable venue. They organized cars and big trucks to, to, to make on their lights. And then we did the ceremony in that situation. We did by force. It reminds us of, of something really simple. Uh, to make democracy and consultation work, you don't need fancy paraphernalia. Lit by the headlights of UN and Amazon vehicles, the 275 parliamentarians who will serve for the next four years are safely sworn in. Somalia at last has an interim constitution, a representative parliament. All that remains is to choose the leadership. The first task of the newly installed parliament is to elect the speaker. On August 28th, the vote count takes place in front of all the candidates in the hall. A favourite to win is Ali Khalif Ghalea. But a respected academic and activist, Mohammed Osman Jawari, unexpectedly emerges as the winner. Winds of change are beginning to blow in Mogadishu. The parliament then turns to the critical task of selecting a president. The powerful former Speaker of Parliament, Sharif Hassan Sheikh Adan, is ruled out, as tradition dictates that the Speaker and President cannot belong to the same clan. The four main contenders for presidency include the incumbent and favourite to win, Sheikh Sharif Sheikh Ahmed. 
former Prime Minister Farmajo, the incumbent Prime Minister Abdiwali, and an outsider, Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud. In under two weeks, Somalia's future president will be decided. It's the morning of the election. As the process uh, moved into a decisive phase, people took stronger and stronger positions. The methods uh, deployed uh, were more and more intimidating and, and, and sometimes very, very negative. Almost a year of progress hangs in the balance. It is the defining moment for the Somalia peace process. But there are rumors of corruption and intimidation to elicit votes. There were rumors that uh, those people who could produce a uh, cell phone photograph of their ballot paper with the right name would be paid a handsome amount of money. What those people did not count on was the, the role of some very tough Somali women uh, of the anti-corruption organization who decided to post themselves uh, at the entrance of the podium where the voting took place. They relieved all the men of their telephone. These gentlemen were actually physically shaken down. The count begins. National and international news teams are recording the event live. Millions of Somalis living in Somalia and in diaspora communities across the world are anxiously awaiting the results or watching the dramatic events being streamed live on the web by UNPOS. In a stunning reversal of the established political order, Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud is overwhelmingly chosen as the new president of Somalia. Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud The real success of this election is not about the winner, but how well the process worked. The challenge for the sponsors of this political transition was to create a process that Somalis could really get behind, that they could have faith in. The manner of this election and the scale of the victory suggest that it might just work. For the first time in a long time, we, we elected um, a president who didn't come to power through weapons. Young kids now going to schools can uh, think that by being a civil society a teacher, you can become a president. With the world watching, the president is sworn in on 16 September. For UNPOS and the rest of the international community, Somalia's political transformation was a culmination of a year of focus and determination for the Somali roadmap to succeed in ending the transition. He was marvelous. I mean, he did a marvelous job in Somalia. And uh, he was passionate about uh, this process succeeding. The UN had a clear-cut role, represented by UNPOS itself. It was critical. They were the spearhead of, of an entire political effort which was meant to create the conditions in which a, an eventual transition could occur. What was unthinkable for Somalis only 12 months before had finally been achieved. There is increasing traffic, trucks and buses that are coming from outside the city and other parts of Somalia. 
This never used to be the case. Today, the diaspora is returning to Somalia. Its dormant economy is beginning to prosper. If it stays this way for the next couple of months or a couple of years, Somali it will go back the way it used to be. I'm definitely, I'm sure of that. The only thing they need Somalis is just peace. Yes. Give it five years of peace. The rate of recovery and the reconstruction and prosperity will come very, very quickly indeed. New government buildings and institutions appear on the Mogadishu skyline. The sound of gunfire has been replaced with a clamor of construction. This process is unique and it happened in this way because of the ownership. Somalis own the process. Somalis are a very a very uh, determined uh, lot. Uh, if they want something to happen, even in an impossible time frame, they will do it. It's a new era for Somalia, and I hope that the president, the speaker, the prime minister, also the parliament, I hope that they don't disappoint the Somalis, and they are expecting a lot from them. This is a self-propelling process. If it succeeds, it will breed more success. The challenge, therefore, is not to let it falter, not even reverse, but keep on gathering momentum.